is feeling good this morning. Welcome. We have a 32 people on, so I'm just going to spend a couple of seconds um, admitting everybody who is in the in the line. I put Dr. June on the spotlight so you can see her. You can give a wave, Dr. June. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. go there's more people coming in well so what i'm going to do is just i'm going to continue adding people in but let's just start uh, because we have a lot of things to cover this morning so welcome dr june it's such a pleasure to have you and thank you so much for spending your friday morning with us uh your hour i know you're very busy and you have patients to see so for everyone who do not know dr june dr june is one of the amazing doctors at osler health international and she's going to share with us and answer all of our questions about menopause and HRT. So Dr. June, let's start the show, shall we? Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for a very kind introduction. And I am just delighted and so privileged um, to have this opportunity to be here to share with you this topic of HRT uh, with a wonderful audience with us this wonderful, this beautiful Friday morning. Thank you all for joining us. Indeed, there is such a lot of information, some of it relatively new on menopause care and HRT. And I feel like a lot of it has been buried under a mountain of COVID-19 news headlines in the past year to two. And so I'm really glad that I'm able to share with you some up-to-date information, um, which I believe represents a pivotal shift in the way we care for women in the menopause these days. Early in my career, 20 years ago, it was routine practice to prescribe HRT, but that changed quite abruptly, quite, quite suddenly, actually, HRT was taken out of the picture. Um, and, um, you know, for me as a woman and a physician, the current knowledge that we have now, the recommendations based on evidence that we have now, signal a huge step forward in improving health and well being in women. This is preventative care, and this is my passion as a GP. Let me start to share my slides. Okay, there, I hope you can all see uh, my screen share there. There is uh, a lot of information, I make no apologies um, uh, for, for today's talk, but I will break it all down for you, keep it all bite-sized. And my aims are to um, give you enough information for you to be able to think about the needs, your needs at the stage of your life, um, and also to empower you to ask the right questions when you go in to see your doctor. All right, let's start with the basics, shall we? What is hormone replacement therapy? It aims to replace the hormones that the body produces, that the body stops producing during the menopause, which is namely estrogen. HRT is widely used for the treatment of menopausal symptoms, and osteoporosis. Now let's get some definitions right. Menopause is defined when a woman goes 12 months without a menstrual period. So if your last period was six months ago, seven months ago, then technically you're not in the menopause yet. You may be in the perimenopause. Peri is Greek for around or near. So perimenopause refers to the stage of of, of life when you're around or near the menopause. And typically this lasts several years and it can start any time from the age of 45 to 55 years of age. The average age at which a woman attains menopause is 51 years. And menopause is a normal and natural event in all women. It occurs when the ovaries stop producing follicles leading to lower levels of estrogen and other hormones. There is usually no need for tests 
to make a diagnosis of the menopause if symptoms are suggestive and you're over the age of 45. In women who have symptoms of the menopause uh, or who stop having periods before the age of 45 or even 40, that we term premature menopause and usually some evaluative tests would be recommended. Now, here is an interesting fact. I'm not sure I would call it a fun fact, but women on average spend about a third of their lives in postmenopause. Postmenopause meaning after the menopause. That is an interesting, interesting fact. And um, for me, that prompts me um, to ask questions about um, what can we expect? What should we be expecting in the menopause? And is there anything we really should be doing to keep ourselves healthy for such a big chunk of our lives. Now, menopause is a natural and normal event, but it does affect many parts of the body and sometimes quite profoundly as well. In the bone, we get osteoporosis. Osteo is bone, porosis, porous, porous bone thin bones, weakened bones. Osteoporosis is known to be directly due to estrogen deficiency, lowered levels of estrogen in the menopause, and it is a major cause of death and disability worldwide. Menopause also affects the urogenital system, so it also affects the urinary tract, the bladder, the vulva, the vaginal area, particularly after after the menopause, um, and this is termed genital urinary syndrome. Menopause has also been recently found to affect the brain, and there are studies that show um, that brain structure, connectivity, and energy consumption are changed in the menopause, which can lead to short-term memory loss, poor concentration, brain fog, and psychological um, affecting psychological well-being as well. Fortunately, there are studies that have shown that cognitive decline is likely to be only temporary during menopause transition and reverses in the following years. The menopause also causes skin changes in elasticity and thickness. And in the heart and blood vessels, well, estrogen has a protective effect from heart disease in premenopausal women. And it is a well-known fact that the risk of heart disease and stroke increases significantly after the menopause. What are the symptoms of menopause? Hot flashes and night sweats, these are vasomotor symptoms and these are known as the hallmark symptoms. Most women will have some degree of these symptoms. Other symptoms include sleep disturbances, vaginal dryness, urinary bladder symptoms, decreased libido, mood changes, sometimes anxiety and depression, fatigue, poor concentration or memory, amongst others. And symptoms vary widely. They can be very different from woman to woman um, in type. They can be very different in type, very different in the severity, and very different in duration of the symptoms as well. Most women, like I said, will have some symptoms and often beginning in the perimenopause and continuing into the menopause and sometimes years after. Hot flushes would be the most common cause of the menopause and it can, a uh, um, symptom of the menopause, affecting up to 80% of women. Um, usually, you know, how do we manage hot flushes? We would advise women to avoid the common triggers, the common triggers being alcohol, smoking, caffeine, drinking hot drinks, spicy food, being in a warm environment. Um, and that of course uh, is difficult to avoid living in Singapore. There are, there's also a lot of um, good evidence to show that regular exercise and weight management will help in managing hot flushes. There are some mind-body relaxation techniques, such as uh, paced respiration, diaphragmatic respiration, which can be done in conjunction with meditation, with yoga, that have been found to be effective. We know that HRT is the most effective treatment of the menopause. Of, I'm sorry, of hot flushes. 
what else is HRT effective for apart from being effective in relieving the basal motor symptoms? It is also very, very useful and very effective in relieving menopausal genital urinary symptoms. So vaginal, vulval irritation, um, urinary and bladder symptoms can, can be quite significantly relieved with HRT. HRT is uh, in the front line um, in preventing and the treatment of osteoporosis and, and always has been. HRT is also known to help improve libido. And there is consensus that women with premature menopause before reaching the age of 40, and that is termed premature ovarian insufficiency, should be advised to take HRT and continue to do so until at least the natural age of menopause, around the age of 51, if there are no contraindications. This has been found to have protective effects from cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and cognitive impairment in this group of women. And this is also largely true for women experiencing early menopause before the age of 45 years, whether naturally or through surgery, such as when the ovaries are removed. Now, so along the same vein of HRT being useful for cardio protection, does HRT protect you from heart disease? And interestingly, there are recent studies that have found, and a lot of studies that have found beneficial effects on the cardiovascular system through um, estrogen's effects on cholesterol, on glucose metabolism, and on arterial function, potentially lowering cholesterol, lowering the risk of diabetes, and even lowering blood pressure. The window of opportunity appears to be um, within 10 years of the menopause to start taking HRT within 10 years of the menopause and before the age of 60. And the dose and type of hormones at the start of therapy appears to be crucial in obtaining such cardiovascular benefits. These are still being studied, of course, and we're, we're waiting um, for more data on this, but certainly the science looks to be heading in a very positive direction. Now, a good question here, does HRT improve cognitive function and prevent Alzheimer's dementia? At the time of, of, of writing, right as of now, there are no clear answers and the current data is conflicting. There are some studies that show um, a decreased risk of dementia, and there are also some studies that show an increased risk of dementia. We know that women, a small group of women who carry a genetic risk of late onset Alzheimer's um, certainly will carry a higher risk of, of dementia after the menopause. Um, and so the role of menopause to reduce risk really has not quite been confirmed yet and will we'll be awaiting larger and longer research and data. Now, let's go into some details now. Types of HRT. Um, there are different approaches to this. And first, let's think about the types of HRT according to um, how they are taken, the different routes of administration. Very broadly, if we look at um, HRT taken for general symptoms, for systemic symptoms, which we term systemic HRT, versus local symptoms. And when, when we talk about local HRT, we're talking about vulval vaginal urinary symptoms, genital urinary symptoms, right? If we look at systemic HRT, which we want to take for general symptoms, such as hot flushes, night sweats, insomnia, um, and etc., systemic HRT can be taken orally in tablets and capsules, or it can be applied on the skin transdermally. So trans means through dermal skin. Transdermal HRT can be used as gels and patches applied to the skin, and the HRT is then taken into the body systemically. All right. Just for your info, patches um, are not easily available, and I actually want to say that they're not available in Singapore, but gels uh, certainly are. When we come to local HRT, remember this is local specific to genital urinary symptoms. Local HRT can be taken through vaginal pessaries and creams. So big picture HRT according to their roots of administration, um, two arms, 
the systemic route, the local route. Under the systemic route, you can take it orally or you can use it transdermally through the skin. The local route um, is given through vaginal pessaries or creams. And note that both systemic and local can be used together. Now, if we look at the types of HRT according to their constituents, all right, again, broad picture, two big groups. There's estrogen alone, and there is estrogen or estrogen plus progesterone. So E alone and E plus P, all right? These are the two main groups. There are different types of E, different types of P, and there are different amounts of E and P in different combinations, okay? What type of HRT would suit me best? These are the four important factors that doctors will go through and evaluate with you. Uh, first, we ask, our, we ask ourselves the stage of menopause. Secondly, what are the symptoms that bother you most? Thirdly, your medical history, your past history, your current medical issues, as well as your family history. And finally, if you have had a hysterectomy. This might may interest a few of you. Estrogen alone, HRT is taken and is given to women who have had a total hysterectomy. So for women who do not have a uterus, they should be taking estrogen alone. Estrogen alone can also be given as a local estrogen therapy for genital urinary symptoms. And this alone can be given to women with an intact uterus safely meaning women who have not have, have had a hysterectomy. Now, E and P combination, this is combined HRT, E and P, and this is given to women with an intact uterus, meaning women who have not had an, a hysterectomy, women who have a uterus. Now, why is that? It is because P plays a very important role in protecting the lining of the uterus, which is known as the endometrium, from overstimulation by estrogen, which can lead to excessive growth of the lining and possibly cancer. This combination of E and P virtually eliminates that risk of uterine cancer when it's taken together because of that protective effect of P. So it's very important to remember that if you have a uterus and you're going on HRT, it is a combination of E and P that you need, right? Combined HRT can be cyclical or it can be continuous. Again, if we zoom out and look at the big picture, HRT in terms of its constituents, right? You have the group E plus P, you have the group E alone. And under E plus P, you've got the cyclical combined HRT and you've also got the continuous combined HRT. Cyclical combined HRT, is a formulation where the P is added for 10 to 14 days of each month, usually in the second half of the month. And a bleed is allowed to occur in the days after finishing that phase of taking the P. So this gives you a natural cycle with monthly bleeds, quite like taking a combined oral contraceptive pill. This, um, the cyclical combined HRT is suitable in perimenopausal women and also in, in women during the first one to two years after menopause. Continuous combined HRT um, is what uh, it is. It is continuous P with E, the same dose of P and E taken every single day without a break. And this allows you to avoid bleeding altogether. And so this is very useful. Well, this, this is suitable for postmenopausal women at least a year, um, having gone without periods for at least a year. Going into a little bit more detail now uh, regarding the types of progestogens, and this is something I, I'd like to highlight. So there are different types of progestogens in different combinations of HRT, and they can be taken uh, progestogens by themselves in the form of oral tablets or capsules. Now, new research shows that different progestogens differ slightly in their risk and side effects. There, there are slightly different, there, there are some differences between the different progestogens. Micronized progesterone is a, it's, it is in fact a bioidentical or body identical progesterone since synthesized from yams 
And this, this type of progesterone is, is actually identical to the progesterone that your body produces, and therefore it is called a bioidentical or body identical um, uh, progesterone. Um, Diadrogesterone is a synthesized progesterone, but it is known to act very similarly to micronized progesterone, very act similarly to a bioidentical progesterone. And both of these progesterones are known to have less side effects and are better tolerated um, in terms of uh, less fluid retention, less weight gain, less acne, um, less of the low mood and anxiety side effects that may come with progesterones. They have also been found to be associated with a lower risk of breast cancer and blood clots than other progesterones in combined HRT. Um, it's also worth mentioning here that the Mirena intrauterine device, uh, which is commonly used as a contraceptive device and a very popular, very popular one too, is effective on its own as the progesterone component of combined HRT. It protects the uterine lining very well and is licensed for this use as part of combined HRT. A word about estrogen. Um, estrogen can be taken orally, vaginally, or, or transdermally, as we've talked about. And in most preparations of HRT now that contain estrogen, it is the body identical estradiol that is available. So that is, that is very, very good to know. Transdermal estrogen that is applied to the skin is preferred for women with certain issues, such as women with gut absorption problems, women suffering from inflammatory bowel disease, for example, who cannot absorb um, medications or active ingredients effectively women with high triglycerides um, and increased risk of blood clots, for example, uh, overweight or smokers, women with migraine, hypertension or liver disease, generally do better and run lower risk of problems when they use transdermal estrogen as opposed to oral estrogen. So a diagram again here to let you know the different combinations of E and P or E alone, if we start at the very top of the circle, that we have E alone therapy, which can be taken orally or transdermally. We have oral E plus P, combined HRT taken orally. We can take oral E plus the Mirena intrauterine device, which um, uh, provides a progestogenic component of the combination. We can also use vaginal E alone, and then we can also use transdermal E, est est uh, estrogen gels, plus Mirena, which provides, again, the P component, and we can also use transdermal E plus oral progesterone. Many different combinations, as you can see, and many options here that are available. Some side effects of HRT. And they're usually short term and mild, especially for the first few months. Uh, a woman may experience breast tenderness, leg cramps, nausea, bloating, irritability, and sometimes depression. And these side effects generally are usually related more to the P component, the progestogen component, rather than the estrogen component. Irregular bleeding can occur during the first three to six months with continuous. HRT, and often what we do is we look at whether the dose of each component needs to be adjusted, maybe the ingredients, the type of progestogen that needs to be adjusted, or the route of administration, how the HRT is taken, can be changed as well. If bleeding is heavy or continues beyond six months or starts suddenly or end unexpectedly, you should see your doctor. Now, the safety of HRT is something that needs addressing to a wider audience. And this was called into question about 20 years ago when the study known as the Women's Health Initiative reported increased breast cancer risk and heart disease from HRT. This had a major impact on menopause treatment practices, which persist 
till this day. I clearly remember when I was in the final year of my residency in family medicine, when I was asked to present the key findings of the study to a group of family physicians, GPs, and, and fellow residents. Um, and it was all done on transparency on an OHP overhead projector, by the way, which was the norm back then. And I remember the stunned silence at the end of the presentation, you know, everybody had read about this study a little earlier, but here we have it. Um, and it was clear in everyone's minds that guidelines were to change massively and that really there were no good alternatives. Um, at that time, there was a lot of media hype all over the world, which caused panic among women and doctors, and the number of women taking HRT fell by a staggering 66%, and this figure has not changed. It's taken years before researchers have realized that some of the data from that study were not, um, in fact, properly analyzed. Some of the study methods were flawed, and some conclusions drawn that were not all accurate. Fortunately, since then, there's been much higher quality research and past findings have been reanalyzed, meta-analyses carried out, and there's actually also been major changes in the types of hormones used in HRT preparations nowadays. So from the recent um, studies and recent um, position statements, this is the main conclusion that in women with a low underlying risk of breast cancer, that is most of the population, HRT is safe to use if started in their 50s or within 10 years of menopause. We'll go into a bit more detail now looking at the risk of breast cancer in HRT users. Firstly, most women will not be diagnosed with breast cancer as a result of their exposure to HRT. Secondly, E alone therapy, estrogen alone, poses little or no increased risk. Thirdly, vaginal estrogen causes no increased risk of breast cancer. Combined ENP does cause a small increased risk that is related to the duration of use and really this translates to an additional four cases of breast cancer in 1,000 women over a period of five years within the age group of 50 to 59. So that is in fact less than one additional case of breast cancer in a year per year per 1,000 women. The um, progestogens, micronized progesterone and didrogesterone that I've spoken about have also been found to be likely to be associated with an even lower risk of breast cancer compared to, to that seen with the other progestogens. And overall, the risk is less than that associated with being overweight or drinking two or more units of alcohol per day. Let's look at risks of blood clots, stroke, and heart disease associated with the use of HRT. Now, oral HRT is associated with a small increased risk of blood clots and stroke, but overall, the risk in women under 60 is small. The risk is similar to that for other risk factors, such as being overweight. Transdermal HRT, which is HRT taken through the skin shows no increased risk of blood clots and stroke. There is also no increased risk of cardiovascular disease when HRT is started within 10 years of menopause or under 60 years of age. And again, the use of micronized progesterone and didrogesterone has been found to be associated with an even lower risk. So Let's look at the big picture then. Um, and overall, we know from recent studies that if women start HRT around the time of menopause, the risks are very small and there appears to be cardiovascular benefits. HRT should be taken for the correct reasons, that is treat the symptoms of menopause or prevent and treat osteoporosis. The dose and duration should be individualized and users should be assessed by their GP at least once a year. The balance of risk to benefit is definitely shifting favorably to the use of HRT. 
This is a symptom score sheet uh, that I've taken off the Australasian Menopause Society website that's very useful in allowing users to score their symptoms on a scale of zero to three, zero for no symptoms, one for mild, two for moderate, three for severe. Uh, this is very useful for you to track your own symptoms very useful, especially to track your symptoms after starting the menopause. And you will see in the second column, three months after starting MH, menopausal hormone therapy. Um, and then in the last column, six months after starting MHT, a useful one for you to track for your own awareness and also to show your doctor and to help the doctor adjust um, treatment as needed. This is based on the modified green scale, and this can be found in various um, menopause apps as well, such as the Balance app. There are cautions to be taken if a woman presents with a background of certain medical histories, such as a history of breast or uterine cancer. And generally speaking, women with such a history should not be taking HRT. Um, if there is undiagnosed abnormal vaginal bleeding, and that means if you present with, if, if you're experiencing unusual or an irregular pattern of bleeding that, that you've not seen a doctor about and that, that has not uh, been evaluated, then we need to take caution before starting HRT. If you have established cardiovascular disease, if you have active liver disease, then it is also important to let your doctor know because HRT may not then be suitable. Going back to undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Now, periods during the perimenopause can become quite irregular and the pattern is, is very variable. And it can be quite difficult to tell between um, bleeding, uh, irregular bleeding that is normal due to hormonal, or hormonal changes, or that may be due to something else that we will term abnormal. Abnormal vaginal bleeding in this age group can be due to many reasons, such as fibroids, um, thickening of the uterine lining, endometrial thickening, polyps, or even cancers. There are other also systemic reasons such as some thyroid disorders that are quite common and should be excluded, should be tested for in any woman presenting with say um, very, very heavy um, bleeding um, that has changed in recent times. And so an irregular menstrual pattern should not be, a, be assumed just to be due to hormonal changes or to the perimenopause. I will ask many questions of my patients when they come in presenting with changed menstrual pattern um, because it's important to get down to um, a, a, a diagnosis, a reason for this before starting any treatment for, for the menopause. I'll ask about the changes. Um, I want the details. We try to look for any red flags and I'll do a gynecological examination if needed. It's a good idea to keep a menstrual diary to chart your menstrual pattern so that it'd be easier for, for you to keep track and for your doctor to review as well. Let me talk about other types of HRT that are available and there are a few more. Tibolone became popular in the years after the first WHI study and it has been perceived as a gentler HRT. It's a synthetic hormone with the combined effects of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And it is usually started at least 12 months after the last menstrual period, so in the postmenopause. It is quite established in preventing osteoporosis, but it has not been researched as extensively as other types of HRT. And more recently, it has been found to be associated with an increased risk of stroke if used in women over the age of 60. So a lot of caution here to be used in women who are taking it for osteoporosis prevention because it's likely that they will need it long-term and beyond their 60s. Testosterone. Now, in September 2019, just before COVID, a global position, a global position statement on the use of testosterone was endorsed by about 20 of the world's leading medical and menopause societies. And transdermal testosterone is recommended for the treatment of postmenopausal women 
with hypoactive sexual desire dysfunction, HSDD, or women with low sexual desire associated with personal distress. Australia is the only country in the world with a licensed testosterone formulation for women known as androphene cream. But elsewhere, there is a male testosterone gel that is available, also available in Singapore and can be used off license in much smaller doses, much smaller amounts for women. Safety data shows no adverse, no serious adverse effects. If we are treating to um, physiologic levels, meaning normal levels of testosterone in a premenopausal women, although long-term safety data <clears throat> is lacking. Women with decreased libido actually usually do respond very well to combined E and P therapy. The estrogen component alone usually does help, but testosterone certainly is an option to add on for women who don't respond to just E alone. Um, one other um, type of um, HRT that uh, became available in recent years, uh, something called Dua V in the US and Dua Viv in uh, Australia and in Europe, a combination of um, two components here, baxadoxaphene and conjugated estrogen. Um, this was FDA approved in 2013, quite a number of years back. Um, it, it is known to prevent osteoporosis and treats menopausal symptoms without the progestogen component, for example, in women who cannot tolerate progestogen. Um, it is used in postmenopausal women. Um, Dua V was recalled in the US though a year ago due to faulty packaging. And as far as I know, it remains um, unavailable. In more recent years with increased uh, knowledge about um, conventional ENP treatment, um, Dua V has been found in trials to be less effective than conventional HRT. And I think it is likely to drop in the pecking order with the newer and safer types of HRT that we now have. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about bioidentical hormones, which many people talk about. Um, many people are also taking bioidentical hormones. Now, what are they? Bioidentical or body identical HRT are hormone preparations, which are identical molecules to those produced by the body. So I'd mentioned earlier that there are several examples of bioidentical hormones that are available in conventional HRT preparations such as micronized progesterone and estradiol that are easily available. Now, very often when people talk about bioidentical HRT, they're often referring, in fact, to compounded bioidentical HRT that for many years has been marketed as more natural and thus safer. So what are compounded? bioidentical HRT. These are preparations that are made by a compounding pharmacist from a doctor's prescription. And unlike drugs that are approved by health authorities to be manufactured and sold in standardized dosages, compounded preparations often are custom made for a patient according to a doctor's specifications on the prescription. Now, this practice of compounding bioidentical hormones usually involves blending commercially available drug products in proportions that are tailored to the individual. So one potential advantage of this is greater dosing flexibility. Now, the problem is most compounded preparations have not undergone any rigorous clinical testing for either safety or efficacy. And the purity, the potency and quality of the products are a concern. They are not subject to regulations controlling the approval of standard drugs. They are not more natural than conventional HRT. They are not safer or more effective than conventional HRT. There are in fact a lot of unknowns under dosage and overdosing being possible. For example, certain progestogen preparations may not actually provide sufficient protection of the uterine lining 
Uh, and if there's underdosing of estrogen, then a woman may not be sufficiently protected from osteoporosis. And if there's overdosing of any component, that of course can be associated with a lot of problems as well. There is a lack of research to determine the safety and efficacy of compounded products. And altogether, it is of course more expensive. Now I'd like to highlight this statement from the British Menopause Society, which is consistent with what every leading menopause society says, that any product which is a bioidentical hormone will carry the same benefits and risks as the HRT products used by, produced by pharmaceutical companies and properly licensed for use. And there is absolutely no evidence that the compounded bioidentical hormones are any safer than those used in traditional HRT. Indeed, they may be less safe. Their production is not monitored by government drug regulatory authorities, and thus their dosage may be inaccurate or inconsistent. Their purity is certainly not guaranteed, and their safety is not tested as it is with approved HRT formulations. Now saying that, I do have a small group, a handful of patients who are receiving compounded bioidentical HRT for various reasons. I do not prescribe it and I will only refer such patients to specialist doctors who have the expertise, who have the experience in prescribing appropriately, prescribing safely and monitoring for adverse effects. Now, if we're thinking about truly natural HRT, then we're talking about this group of complementary herbal HRT products that are promoted as natural or herbal remedies, such as soy, black cohosh, um, isoflavones, which is a type of phytoestrogen, plant estrogen found in soy foods, tofu, tempeh, soy milk, edamame, uh, red clover, flaxseed. Now, Many studies, most studies are in fact inconsistent and inconclusive. There is some evidence for soy and black cohosh. Some, such as St. John's wort, are associated with multiple drug interactions. So it's important that if you are thinking of starting something that you talk to your doctor about this. Again, not all is known about dosages and potential risks. Um, not all is known about the quality, the purity, and the ingredients in the products. Um, and it is very, very important that the estrogen-like effects of some of the herbal remedies may not always be suitable, especially in women, for example, who have a history of breast cancer or uterine cancer. There are some options, some in fact very, very good non-hormonal options for the treatment of menopause, in fact, for women who cannot be taking hormonal therapy altogether. The SSRI, selective serotonin receptor inhibitors, and the SNRI, serotonin noradrenergic receptor inhibitors, commonly used as antidepressants, are also very effective. In fact, up to 70% of women with severe hot flushes and night sweats will respond well to SSRIs and SNRIs, such as escitalopram, paroxetine, and venlafaxine. Gabapentin is a neuroleptic drug. At higher doses, it is used as an anti-epileptic anti drug, but at lower doses, it's been found to be also very effective for hot flushes and night sweats. Clonidine is a fairly old-fashioned antihypertensive medication. We don't use a lot of it nowadays, but if a woman cannot take hormone therapy and has mild high blood pressure and is suffering from a lot of symptoms, then clonidine is an option. We come to not other non-hormonal um, therapies, including complementary mind-body therapies. And some of these have actually shown good evidence associated, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which shows good evidence and it works for stress, anxiety, low mood, hot flushes and night sweats. Basically, it focuses on the links between physical symptoms, your thoughts and feelings and behavior. The way that we think about our symptoms in certain situations can affect how we feel and how we react 
and what we do can increase the intensity of bodily reactions. And so CBT has been found to be very helpful in this respect. Mindfulness-based stress reduction, such as, like I mentioned, paced respiration, diaphragmatic breathing, um, with or without meditation, yoga, come with good evidence as well. Acupuncture has also been found to be quite useful. Come to almost the end of my presentation, almost the last slide here, but um, uh, about uh, managing menopause altogether. I cannot emphasize enough how important lifestyle measures are, regardless of the severity of the symptoms and whether or not you are taking HRT. Lifestyle measures are the recommended first line treatment of menopause symptoms and the prevention of osteoporosis. And this includes having a healthy and nutritious diet, enough calcium, iron and B12, frequent exercise, weight bearing, cardio activity, flexibility and strength training, quitting smoking, cutting back on alcohol, ensure, ensuring that you're sleeping well, not just in terms of duration, but good quality, and managing your mental well-being, managing your stress, assessing your psychological health, identifying signs of anxiety and or depression, and doing something about it. My three take-home messages today, treatment must be individualized. The HRT that your friend is taking may not be suitable for you. No two women are the same. Each woman experiences different symptoms of the menopause to different extents, have different medical and family histories. They lead different lifestyles and have different perspectives, different preferences, different priorities. There is no one size fits all approach. And it is important that you find a GP who is willing to listen, and help you address your needs. For the majority of women who use HRT for the short-term treatment of symptoms of menopause, the benefits outweigh the risks. And this is quite well established from all the recent data that we have. Women on HRT should see their GPs at least annually for follow-up. And I would say that all women should see their GPs regularly for conversations on their health, on menopausal health, on bone health, and also to ensure that you're up to date with routine screening like cervical cancer, your pap smears, your breast screening, um, colorectal cancer screening for women above the age of 50, cardiovascular screening, make sure that you get your blood pressure checked, cholesterol levels assessed, diabetes screening done. This is all essential health screening and preventive care that every woman is entitled to. I believe we have time to take some questions and I'll be very happy to answer as many um, as I can. Um, but before I hand the floor back to Susan, just a little bit about our practice here at Osler Health International with two clinics. I'm based at the Raffles Hotel Arcade branch. We have another branch at the Star Vista. We're a general practice clinic with internationally trained doctors. We see babies, children, women, men. Uh, we do COVID-19 tests, pre-departure testing, issue fit to fly certificates, and more recently, verification of overseas COVID-19 vaccinations. We have a fact sheet prepared for all our viewers um, today. And this is one that will consolidate all the information from this rather lengthy presentation I've given you. So I hope that, that um, you, will, you will find um, very useful. But um, you know, at the end of it, treatment has to be individualized. Every woman is different. So um, you're more than welcome to come in to have a chat with any of us here um, to talk about your needs. I'll stop sharing my screen and Susan hand the floor back to you. Thank you so much. So I've put the spotlight on Dr. June so, so that the, the camera won't bounce around when we ask questions. But thank you so much, Dr. June. That was very, very, very informative. And, and we have a few questions for you. So number one is when does one end their HRT journey? Can, can it can it last like 10 years, 20 years? I know you mentioned it before, but what's the, um, the general timeframe we're looking at here? 
So that's a very good question. And the latest recommendations are that there should be no end, no definite end point. You know, we can't say that, okay, by the age of um, 60, that's it for HRT. It is all going to be very individualized. A lot depends on the reasons for which you're taking HRT. If you're taking HRT purely for the relief of symptoms, then we do expect that symptoms often resolve within two years or so after the menopause. And if there's no need to be taking HRT for those symptoms anymore, then there's no need to continue. Um, I've, I mentioned a few times that the current guidelines say that generally it is safe to be taking HRT within 10 years of starting the menopause or below the age of 60. So those are guidelines in terms of managing risks and benefits. So for every individual patient, we'll have to look at their risks as well. If they are, if a, if, if a woman happens to be at a higher risk of adverse problems of complications, for example, then I would probably say, okay, look, perhaps by the age of 60, we need to look at whether we need to assess the necessity of continuing on HRT versus your needs and versus your risks. Um, for osteoporosis prevention, I think I mentioned somewhere as well, because very often long-term treatment is needed. Beyond the age of 60, it is very likely that the doctor will advise switching to a different anti-osteoporosis drug, just because along the way, this balance of benefits and risks um, has to be done. I hope that um, mm. really answers the question. Yeah, it did. Thank you very much. And I just want to say thank you very much for everybody who has come this morning to kind of share and and you know ask questions about menopause and HRT because I know for a fact not a lot of people are talking about it. Um, so thank you very much for for putting all these questions here. Uh, we have another one. Um, starting HRT. Does having a history of breast cancer include my mother having had breast cancer or is it just my history of having breast cancer? Does it, you need to have the whole family's background? No, we're talking about a personal history of breast cancer. So for an individual who has had breast cancer before or who may still be undergoing treatment, then generally HRT is not advisable in such an individual. Now, in an individual who does not have breast cancer, but has a family history, then again, we'll be looking at the details. Is there a family history that involves the presence of a genetic mutation, the BRCA gene, the BRCA gene mutation, which is in the minority of breast cancer patients, really? But if I'm speaking to an individual who is known to have tested positive for the BRCA gene, then a lot of caution here to be taken um, because there is a high risk. We're talking about an individual with a very high risk of developing breast cancer. And of course, there will be other things that um, I'll be advising in terms of monitoring and screening. Um, in an individual, however, with a, with a family history, but who has not um, tested positive for the, 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 the gene involved, or who has, yes, um, maybe just one member of the family who has had breast cancer and appears to be at lower risk of breast cancer, then this conversation about starting HRT is appropriate. Um, it, is, it is really the personal history of breast cancer that is a contraindication to the use of HRT. Okay. But what if it's the person who had breast cancer in an early age and gotten the all clear now that they are a little bit older, mm. are they okay to take HRT or is that something that should be thought of quite, you know? Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is a, quite a dilemma. It's, it's mm. a very difficult situation. Um, 70 to 80% of breast cancers are hormone sensitive cancers. Uh, hormone receptor positive cancers. And even, um, you know, taking everything into entirety, um, breast, breast cancers, even if they're not hormone sensitive, they're hormone receptor negative, um, there is, studies have found an increased risk of recurrence in, in women um, taking HRT 
um, after they've had a history of breast cancer. So, so currently, you know, this is this is a difficult difficult area. Most oncologists um, will say yes, there is enough study. You know, there is there's enough data here to tell us that it is not a good idea, even if it's been years since recovery uh, from breast cancer, to be going on HRT because of that risk of the breast cancer returning, whether returning in the breast or elsewhere in the body as metastases. So that's, that's a problem there. Um, there is another issue, another point, in fact, that uh, should be taken up in individuals um, with a past history of breast cancer. If there are significant genital urinary symptoms, then perhaps the option, you know, we'll be asking ourselves, is the option of vaginal local estrogen therapy safe in such women? Because after all, it acts locally. Not much of it, if hardly any of it is absorbed systemically. So could this be a safe option in breast cancer survivors? And can, can this be taken safely? The, the verdict is still out, actually. There, there isn't enough data to show that this is indeed going to be safe and it is not associated with an increased risk of the cancer returning. So this has to be weighed um, carefully um, and discussed in detail with, with the oncologist and with your doctor. Um, now, thirdly, my third point would be that it's important to know that there are non-hormonal options that are effective in the treatment of menopausal symptoms in breast cancer survivors. So we talked about some uh, non-hormonal drugs that can be taken for hot flushes. For vaginal symptoms, there um, are a number of vaginal moisturizers uh, and creams that can be used to give relief as well. So um, there, are, there are many non-hormonal options to look at that are safe in breast cancer survivors. Yeah, actually in Denmark, they are treating or giving cannabis to women mm -hmm. um, for treatment of, of menopause, which, you know, is very exciting in Denmark, but obviously we can't have that here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another question. Um, this is about the vaginal cream. Is it applied every day? Mm, okay, so vaginal therapies come as creams or pessaries, yeah? Uh, I would say pessaries are easier to use. For starters, we do a priming period of usage, of dosing, of applying every day for two weeks. This helps to prime, to re-moisturize, to recondition, to reintroduce estrogen to the vaginal tissue. Yeah, and it requires daily application for just the first two weeks. After that, we move into a maintenance phase where we only need an application twice a week. So you choose two separate days in a week, like Sunday and Wednesday, um, bedtime use just twice a week for the maintenance uh, therapy part of it. Great. Oh, I, I thought it was applied every day for like 10 years or something. That's why I asked. Um, Another question, does testosterone help with low aches and pains, energy level and brain fog? Is the testosterone gel available in Sing Singapore, bioidentical? Good question. So the male formulation of testosterone gel is available in Singapore. The male formulation um, can be used off license. We can prescribe it and uh, advice on the amount that you should be using, which will be a very small amount compared to what is given to men. Okay, so that's testosterone gel, which is available. Now, is it effective um, in relieving brain fog, aches and pains, increasing energy? Um, I think anecdote, anecdotally, Anecdotally, many, many people will say that it does help. Although the studies have been inconclusive and inconsistent with that respect, the studies um, found um, for testosterone have been very consistent with improving the BDO. Yeah, with all the other symptoms, a little less convincing. Right, okay, that sounds good. Um, another question, I am 53 and have the Mirena and is taking a capsule. Let me see if I uh, pronounce this right. Progesterone and estradiol. Mm -hmm. Should I change to 
to only an oral E due to the Mirena. This is, you probably want to take this offline because it's quite specific, mm. but. Mm. Um, if you have the Mirena on board, it serves as a, it's, it's, it's great for um, uterine lining protection. You know, so that is your P component, which you should keep for uterine protection. And then just take an E on top of that, whether you want to use an oral estrogen or an estrogen gel. And you mm -hmm. don't have to take an additional oral progesterone because the Mirena is there as the progesterone. Does that okay. answer the question? I think so. Um... Does HRT normally covered by insurance? I think one must ask their insurance for this, this yeah. question, right? Yes. Okay. Another question. If you carry the BRCA1 gene, which predisposes you to a higher risk of breast cancer, should you continue with HRT? I am on Femistin. Oh, okay. Um, this has to be a conversation with mm. your doctor, um, if you're seeing a specialist uh, who's monitoring you closely for breast changes, then this is a, a serious conversation to, to, to have with uh, him or her as well, because clearly you are at an increased risk of developing breast cancer. And so um, is, is, is HRT suitable? Is it safe to use um, if you're being carefully monitored? Um, sure, certainly that, that would be definitely advisable. Um, duration of use as well. I think that, that is a good question too. If, if, you, um, if your doctor agrees with you that you're okay going on HRT, then um, how long would you be aiming for? What, what are the aims for taking HRT? I think has to be addressed as well. Mm, yeah, definitely. Uh, another question... Um, is it safe to use HRT if I have, if you have fibroids? Mm, good question. So fibroids are stimulated by estrogen. Yeah. Um, if they are small, not causing a lot of problems at all, not causing too much complications at all, then just monitoring the size of the fibroids while on HRT will be fine. It, fibroids is not a contraindication to the use of HRT or even a past history of fibroids. Let's say you're in the postmenopause and you had fibroids before, which are expected to not cause problems or to shrink. Uh, in fact, even uh, in the menopause, um, then it's, it's, it's not a contraindication. You can use HRT safely provided they are monitored. Right, okay. Um, is it hard to get the balance right? under or overdose of estrogen. What happens if you get overdosed of estrogen? Overdosing of estrogen doesn't usually cause sudden severe side effects, not, not usually. Um, we're thinking more in terms of long-term risks. If an individual overdoses on estrogen, there could be an increased risk of the stimulation effects of estrogen on the breast, on various tissues in the body. Therefore, it could, it could lead to increased risk in the breast. It could lead to increased risks um, in the cardiovascular system. Um, but overall, it doesn't, it doesn't present as a side effects per se. If right, okay. I thought you'd be more like emotional, depressed and things like that, so. <laughs> right. <If> Extra. <laughs> there's an, an imbalance. Usually um, side effects from HRT come from the progestin component. And so that you know, can be adjusted. There are various ways of adjusting dosing and components. Right. Another question. I am taking Vegifem, the local estrogen. How long can I take this for? So Vegifem is an estrogen pessary that is used for the treatment of vulval vaginal symptoms. And Vagifem is known, Vagifem at its lowest dose, 10 micrograms is known to be safe long-term. It can be taken in women with a uterus. It does not need a progestogen component for protection. It is very safe to use for the long-term. Right, okay. And the non-hormonal treatments that you mentioned before, are they taken orally? Are they in like a capsule or? Hmm. They uh, are. Yeah, 
Right, the non-hormonal treatments, the SSRIs, um, uh, the antidepressants, they're taken orally, yes, uh, as well as gabapentin, it's also taken orally. None of them are given in other routes. In fact, they're all oral. Okay, this is my favorite question. How do you delay menopause? <laughs> my friend says 46 is too early to start pre-menopause and advised me to delay it. I already exercise nine to 13 hours a week, so exercise shouldn't be an issue. That's a lot of exercising. Um, yes, but that's a great question. And I'd like to know, how do you delay it? Can you? I'm afraid we can't delay menopause, but we can delay the effects um, the not so desirable effects of menopause through everything that you're doing, the exercise, looking, yourself, looking after yourself well, um, keeping mental well-being. These are all very important aspects of life, not to delay menopause, but to keep yourself well and healthy altogether. Okay. Yes, I feared that one. Can't delay it. <laughs> oh, just monitor it. Um, similar to an early question, are there studies that you know women can go to look for in, that are uh, mentioning about the 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 long term effects of HRT longer than ten years? Can you point us to the right direction of where to read those studies? You'll get a lot of good information from um, the websites of the various menopause societies. Uh, in terms of details of studies, I think a lot of that will still be ongoing um, and we won't have um, clear results till um, quite some time later. But um, if you look at, say, the British Menopause Society website or the Australasian Menopause Society website, um, even on the NHS uh, website on HRT, um, it's a very good website and, and we have a few of these internet resources on our fact sheet, by the way, that will come to you, uh, a website called Women's Health Concern, which is uh, published by the British Menopause Society. There's some, there's some very, very good articles there um, and um, uh, findings that reiterate um, current, current knowledge and current data. But in terms of longer term, beyond 10 years use, you know, I think um, we're going to have to see, uh, wait and see if, if anyone's going to be doing substantial uh, studies in that area. Okay, yeah, that's maybe perhaps when we send all the, um, the information to everyone, maybe we can ask you for a link, uh, but definitely a lot of information out there for sure. Another, per another question is for a person with breast cyst, Will taking HRT result in more cysts? Um, a good question again. And again, um, you know, theoretically, estrogen does stimulate breast, breast tissue. Um, it is a possibility. It is a possibility. But overall, if we bear in mind that, um, if, if we know for starters that um, the cyst that you have is benign, and most breast cysts are benign. Um, and that if this condition is, is monitored uh, through ultrasound scans, through mammogram, then there shouldn't be too much of a worry that if you're in the low risk uh, population altogether, there shouldn't be too much of a worry that um, HRT could potentially be harmful. Mm. Okay, another question. To what extent does menopause, perimenopause cause weight gain change metabolism, etc. The web seems to be full of sites which suggest women over 40 need to exercise differently to lose weight, etc. Because of the menopause, I would be interested in your view on this. Mm -hmm. So there are many different factors contributing to weight gain, you know, after the age of 40, after 50. It's, it's not all because of hormonal changes. It is also a um, pretty... <sighs> I would say normal occurrence with lowered metabolism, your, your metabolic weight goes down as we get older. It is um, quite expected um, that, you know, that, that this occurs in the normal process of aging as well. So it's not, it's not all completely hormonal. 
Um, with respect to different types of exercises, um, I would imagine that perhaps because of um, a shift in body fat distribution, uh, once we get into the perimenopausal and menopause stage, the hormonal changes do cause a change in um, body fat composition. So more of it is uh, accumulated in the mid section. Yeah. And so um, I, I'm guessing that th there may be different types of exercises that focuses on um, reducing that midsection um, and etc. But generally, what is recommended and why there's been so much advice on giving on, on, on um, promoting exercises because of the huge amount of benefits that come with exercise, not just weight management, but reducing cardiovascular risk, reducing cancer risk. There's there are just so many, many benefits that come um, with regular exercise. And what's been recommended is 30 minutes on most days of the week, you know, at least five days of the week. Um, and we can aim for that 150 minutes of exercise a week. That that falls in line with what's currently recommended overall. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good tip. Um, yes, this losing weight business is really hard once you, uh, once you hit 40 anyway, um, right? I know. Well, everyone says thank you very much, Dr. June. I think, um, yeah, that was a very good and informative presentation. Thanks so much. We, I have recorded it, so I'm going to send it to people if they want to revisit uh, the presentation again and, and take notes uh, from the slides. And, and definitely, they can come and see you at, at your clinic yeah. at the raffles. Yeah, I would, I would so, love to um, help uh, in any way possible. And it's, it's been such a pleasure, Susan. Oh, what, a, what a really uh, great privilege to have had this opportunity to speak on this the subject. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And sorry, someone is calling me. Go, go away. Um, thank you so much. Have a nice day and have a nice weekend, everybody. Sorry about my, my calling on my phone. Um, thank you so much for all the information. We are going to send out the fact sheets for everybody and um, hopefully, hopefully everyone gets it this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. June. Have a great day. Take care, everyone. Bye.